Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Nice to see you all. Um, uh, happy to be here today and talk to some people I admire deeply. Uh, of course, like you, probably, I've been reading Nick and, and Cheryl's work. And Nick's work at, in the New York Times as a columnist, and of course, the great work they've done together. And happy to have Maro and Josh here. Um, I think, as, as we just heard, they really don't need an introduction, but I'll give you one a little, a short one anyway. Uh, Nick Kristoff and Cheryl Wudan together have won the Pulitzer Prize for their reporting in China during the Tiananmen Square protests. They've helped bring the world's attention to Darfur and more recently helped shape the way we think of global women's rights with their book and transmedia project. Half the Sky, and Maro Tremayev and Josh Bennett collaborated with Nick and Cheryl on this film that we're talking about, as well as several previous projects. Uh, as you know, or as you heard, Maro is the founding partner and principal of the award-winning global production media company, Show of Force, and Josh is Show of Force's executive vice president and executive producer. So I'm excited to hear more about this film. And of course, Nick, you and I have talked about your book. Um, I was happy to provide a blurb for it, an honor to be asked. But I know this, this movie really uh, raises issues about inequality, poverty, the crisis, and the American working class. And it's, it's deeply personal for you, as you note in the opening of this film, Nearly a quarter of the kids that rode the number school number six school bus with you growing up in Yamhill, Oregon, have died from what they call deaths of despair, opioid abuse, suicide, and other preventable yet fatal health issues. Um, you know, I still, every time I say that, Nick, I can't get over that. A quarter of the kids. And you are how old now, if I may ask? 29. <laughs> 60, alas. Yeah. Just turned 60. You just turned 60. So these, you know, kids that you grew up with all died very young. And as we said, through a multiple, uh, you know, multiple reasons, uh, multiple causes of death. You know, as you saw this unfold, I can't imagine how it affected you personally. And, and I kept thinking as I read about the book and about this film gosh, how did Nick get out of there? And and these other kids faced these terrible fates. But just it, talk to us a little bit about your realization that this, this was happening in your community. Was it sort of a slow drip, 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 or a sudden kind of epiphany about it? So um, my hometown, Yamhill, it's a little farm town of about 1,000 people. Uh, the traditional employers were agriculture, timber, and light manufacturing. It's an area that had prospered mightily during the 20th century. It had done exceptionally well. And then it kind of fell apart in the, basically in the 1980s when the jobs went away. And so Cheryl and I would be gallivanting around the world reporting on various humanitarian issues. And uh, my mom is still on the family farm. We'd go back. And I'd reconnect with classmates, and you know, every time we went back, there would be another crisis, and another overdose, or another person arrested, and uh, and it is really painful to see a community that you care deeply about just disintegrate in this way. And it, uh, you know, you know, they're they're. There were two families. We, we sort of focus on the on the kids who were on the school bus, and there were uh, there were two families of each five kids on the school bus. With in each case, the oldest kid was my year, uh, and then the siblings were younger. And in each case, uh, four of the five kids are now dead, and it's uh, drugs, it's alcohol, it's suicide, it's reckless accidents, but. I think one reason we wanted to tell the story, both in the book and the documentary, is that there tends to be, 
in the US, we, we tend to dismiss those who engage in self-destructive behaviors. And look, these, you know, there were plenty of self-destructive behaviors here, but what struck me is that, you know, their parents had done phenomenally well because there were good jobs available. There were good union jobs available. They bought home, one was a cement finisher, uh, one laid pipe, uh, they'd done extraordinarily well. And then the same families, when jobs went away, just blew up. And we hope that by telling their stories, and maybe especially in film, when you see, when you see them, maybe we can leverage those stories just a little bit to try to build a little bit of understanding and compassion as an engine for better policies to try to address this. You know, it really does um, underscore uh, the problems uh, that, are, that we face in all of America. So uh, if you look at what we were doing when we were in Asia and we were watching as countries like China and South Korea and Taiwan were just focusing on, oh, education is so important, education is so important. We hadn't appreciated how important it was because in a flash, these countries all of a sudden you know, became power, economic powerhouses. At the same time, during those same three decades uh, in Yamhill, uh, we had stasis. We had people who were actually dropping out of high school. We had, you know, some of Nick's friends who they fell into drugs because they couldn't get a good job. But education was never something that really was important. For instance, uh, in two of the families, in one of the families at least, um, the mother, D, she actually had maybe a third grade education. Her husband, the father, could barely write his name, okay? So for her, it's like, oh, my kids, well, if they go to school, that's great. If not, it, it wasn't, she got by without it, so it's not as though the kids really need it needed it, and there wasn't this focus on trying to educate your kids because if something happens when they become adults, they can function on their own. So it really underscored for us the differences between here we are in Asia watching this economic powerhouse uh, of a continent grow, and then in Yamhill we saw this, this, this stasis, um, very little change. Uh, that is also happening in pockets all over America. And I know Yamhill isn't the only community you visit or not the only characters in the film. Let's take a quick look at a trailer for Tightrope and then we'll keep talking about it and some of the stories. Your, the statement in the trailer, it's time for a new version of the American Dream, one that includes ev everybody. Um, but before we talk about what we need to do to get there. How did we reach a point where the American dream was so unattainable? Um, when you all look at the big picture, because I know Cheryl, you really focus on sort of the macro issues. And I know Nick, one of your specialties is really kind of telling personal stories to illustrate bigger problems. So, you know, is it the demise of manufacturing? Is it globalism you know, or globalization? Uh, the, you know, Tom Friedman often talks about the winners and losers that we never really considered as the world did grow flatter, as he would say. So what do you, what would you, can you tick off the factors that, I know you kind of alluded to them earlier, but that have really gotten us here in the first place. And then we'll talk tomorrow and Josh about turning this story into a, a film and some of the challenges there. So it's sort of inter it's interesting. So Yamhill is a, almost all white community. And I remember in the 1970s and 1980s, there were a lot of harsh comments made in Yamhill about black communities in the US and comments about how, you know, if only people were working more, if only dads were more present in families, uh, if only people were not uh, using drugs so much, then everything would be fine. And there was a Harvard sociologist, Bill Wilson, who wrote a famous diagnosis of the problem, said basically it's all about jobs that when jobs left those inner cities, that then various pathologies followed. And that's exactly what happened in White Yam Hill, that when blue collar jobs left, then that was devastating for the morale of men in particular. They self-medicated with meth and with alcohol. They then became, they got criminal records, they became less employable, they became less marriageable. The family structure shattered very, very quickly and compounds, and everything compounded and multiplied. And so 
At some level, the problems are indeed globalization, automation, but these are problems that have affected the entire world. And it's only the US that has seen life expectancy drop three years in a row. And you know, Cheryl and I compared what happened to unemployed auto workers in uh, Detroit and then in Windsor on the Canadian side of the border. And some job losses were unavoidable, but Canada provided much, much better job retraining. And as a result, on the Canadian side, those former auto workers are, are much more likely to have jobs, much less likely to be uh, abusing drugs or alcohol. Their kids are much more likely to be doing okay today. So there were global wins that buffeted us, and we profoundly mishandled them over half a century. How so? You know, I know that the average age for the, the, the I guess the, the average age for committing suicide or the largest population who commits suicide is a 47-year-old white male in this country because I know when I did this white anxiety hour for National Geographic. So what, where do we go wrong? What, you know, if you compare the U.S. and Canada, what did the Canadian government do? And by the way, I know a very, very small percentage of our GDP is allocated for retraining in the face of automa automation. So what should, what did Canada do, do that we didn't? Well, it's a number of things. And so jobs are very important, but good jobs also mask a lot of um, weaknesses in society. Uh, included in that is uh, lack of education. So for instance, we are number 61 when it comes to graduation rates for high school. We used to be the best. We pioneered mass education, mass high school education in, in you know here in the US, in the world, and now we're number 61. Uh, we basically, 85% of you know uh, Americans graduate high school, so there's 15% who are not graduating high school. Uh, and uh, that's one factor. The other factor is in Canada, they also have national health care. And so when people lose their job, it's not like, oh my goodness, if I have a health care bill, I'm going to be bankrupt. So they actually can still, they still have health care. So it's an all-encompassing uh, societal, uh, you know, uh, um, matrix and, uh, you know, that is helping support uh, people in general. And it's not like we want to... Uh, create a society where everybody is, you know, you know, holding their hand out for handouts. That's not the point. The point is when you need a safety net, you use it. But because no one wants to just live on a safety net. Even the people that we talk to, they wanted to be able to fend for their own. They were embarrassed that they had to, you know, go f go for, you know, sort of subsidies or or whatever, um, you know, housing subsidies. They, they they're embarrassed. Nobody wants to live off of that for the rest of their life. But you do need help. Uh, and some of these people, uh, you know, if they don't have a high school education, and if on their job, if it's a construction job, or if it's, you know, we met a lot of people who were, you know, there are many different types of construction jobs, and so you specialize. So one was laying cement in a certain kind of way. And so when they didn't need those kind of people, then it's not like he could just shift to another kind of, um, you know, construction job very easily. And so he's out of a job. And so the problem is that, you know, uh, we don't have uh, places to go to to learn where to train. In other words, it's not as though there are, you know, um, they don't have to be government run, but we just don't have a lot of training facilities that are available for the working class. We have them, you know, we have, we have coding schools for the white collar educated people, but you know, someone who's a bricklayer is just not gonna go to coding school. So we need a wide variety of retraining programs, and other countries do this, and they do it well. We have trade assistance, uh, programs that allow you, if you lo lost your job through globalization, then you can uh, you can apply. The, the company that you know had to lay off people applies so that you can get trade assistance. It's a very narrow, small program. That's about it. Let's talk, I, I mean, we could talk about this all day because it's so fascinating and so tragic, but, but Maro and Josh, how did you all start collaborating with with Nick and Cheryl, because this is not your first rodeo with these two. You all <laughs> did uh, Half the no. Sky, and you did A, a Path of Peers. Um, why do you find this kind of documentary filmmaking and this kind of real, you know, actually on the ground reporting so gratifying and satisfying? Um, well, we met Nick and Cheryl, I'd say 10 years ago. It was when they were still in the galleys, I don't even know that half, that half the sky had come out yet. 
And um, they were in conversations, and there was a lot of support from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Uh, Pat Harrison had been in the State Department, uh, and she cared about these issues, and she really cared about women and girls' issues. So she was exceedingly excited, but then immediately said, well, how are we going to do this? How are we going to make all this really hard to talk about stuff um, accessible to people? So, uh, you know, I, I had done a lot of work in, in public television, and so she connected us, and immediately um, I got hooked, <laughs> not only on how significant the ideas were, but how um, authentic Nick and Cheryl were in the work they had done and the stories that they were telling, the people that they were meeting on the ground. And they're also, um, their very um, dedicated commitment to talking about solutions, whether those were people on the ground that were that were doing unbelievable work in their own communities and, and not having a light shown on them, but also what's going on in the world that you don't know about where we can bridge the gap between us and them and stop seeing our, ourselves as so different from people who were just facing enormous challenges. And in the early work, it was enormous challenges in and around uh, women and girls, girls' education, girls that were being um, you know, subjected to female genital mutilation. We, you know, they, these were all topics that, you know, you, you almost say them out loud in a room. I mean, education you can kind of get away with, but a lot of things that are happening to girls you barely want to talk about. They're so, they're so upsetting. I mean, the number of girls that, that are sex trafficked internationally and here in the U.S. So when, when Half the Sky became this just unbelievable success and considering the tough nature of the material, it was incredible the um, the response that really globally there was uh, for the book and for finally telling these stories. So we we were we were really excited to try to say, how, well, how can we tell these stories and what can we do? And um, it sort of began this 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 really interesting relationship that in that case in the first book the book had been written, but all the stories were from the past. They had already happened and. You know, you know very well when you're trying to tell stories in film, you want them to be unfolding. You want to meet people in their process. So in the first book, we actually um, sort of went towards those agents of change and those larger themes and stories and organizations and NGOs that they had earmarked in the book as really um, making sustainable, scalable uh, change and that you could get behind. But then when we, wanted, when, when we went on to continue to work after that, which was a, an enormous success, both the series and the book, we then started to do something which is quite unusual, which is that they wrote the book and we made the films at the same time. And that's actually been a really interesting process for us in the case of A Path Appears, um, their last book, that was a, a series, a long form series, where we were addressing you know, similar issues, but taking place here in the US and in uh, Latin America. Uh, we were also um, in Haiti. We were, you know, we were looking, you know, sort of more in our region. And then, um, and then now we also started at the same time. So the, the, the interesting process is that we sort of find characters and they're finding their, you know, they're finding their stories and we're sort of swapping and talking and which things are really gonna work on film. And you know, important in this panel is what is the difference between what can go in the book what Nick might draw out for a column, what are the larger themes that we feel are critical to address, and then how do we find characters and stories that will reveal those. So well, that's me, our big effort. Let me ask Josh about that. Yeah. I'm just curious um, how you're able, I think Nick and Cheryl would probably be the first to say many of these people are very proud and are embarrassed and ashamed of their situations. And how were you able to get some of these folks to talk about really painful stuff so openly and honestly and not sort of exploit their situations? Yeah, I think, um, you know, it's, it's always such an enormous responsibility and it's a privilege when, you know, people open up to you and when the the individuals you film or you write about uh, share the most personal, most difficult moments of their lives. Um, and you know, the thing that really, I think, transformed the way I approach 
making film, and I think some of my colleagues, you know, working with Nick and Cheryl, you know, it, it doesn't stop when the film is done and when the interview is done. You know, there's an enormous commitment you're making to people to tell that story and to have that story then used in a way that can have some positive impact and social change. I mean, this is really advocacy work. This, you know, the films that we've made together are about putting these issues out in front, shining a spotlight on stories where people's individual stories become something much bigger for everybody to witness and to see and to hopefully be affected by. And so I think when people recognize that, that their story is a vehicle for doing some real good in the world, there's a comfort level that comes with that. There's a sense of trust that this is about something more than making a film that will win an award or getting their story and getting them to an emotional place. This is, I think, in service of something bigger. And that's, I think, the most we can ask for as filmmakers and as artists is to, to be doing something that we truly believe in uh, that does serve a bigger goal. And I will say that all of these films take a village, and it's really uh, great to have here with us um, a show of force in her own right, Mira Chang, who was a co-executive producer and series producer on Half the Sky and A Path Appears, and co-executive on this project, and Viva Van Luke, who did a fantastic job directing the film Tightrope, um, which is going to be premiering on November 13th. And I think that's the thing, when you work with people like Nick and Cheryl, it brings out the best in you, and it brings together a great group of people who really believe in the work, and, and that you feel that. Do you, was there a, any situation where someone was just too fragile and you said, you know, I really cannot subject this individual. They're, they're too much on the tightrope to be featured. Mm -hmm. yeah, there was a moment, I mean, um, when we first went to Yam Hill, um, you know, we were at uh, Nick's family home, and uh, there was a question about um, going to film with um, his childhood friend, Clayton Green, who was really not... Um, in good shape, and you'll see him in the film. Um, and it was striking to look at the yearbook he, he's photos. He's the guy in the trailer, the big bearded guy in the in the trailer. Yeah. yeah. I, so you know, he was a young guy who uh, was younger than Nick. And you know, you look at a photo of him in a yearbook, and he's this young, uh, wiry kid. Um, you know, the whole world's before him, and now he's a man who is uh, you know over 400 pounds, practically bedridden, and not looking well. And he did not want to participate. And it was a moment where we didn't want to push because we felt, okay, this is somebody dealing with a very difficult health crisis uh, in a really bad place. But, you know, we talked to Nick and said, you know, this is your friend, this is your relationship. Uh, if, if you want to talk to him and he really trusts you, uh, you know, then we're open to going back to film with him. And I think that's where it counted on, you know, really knowing that Nick is who Nick is and that opened the door and he said, okay, I'll trust you guys and we came back and then that helped open the door to telling the story of the Green family, which is a big part of the, uh, the tightrope film. And in fact, Clayton is Kevin Green's younger brother and Kevin Green was in some ways the impetus for this whole project because you wrote an op-ed about Kevin Green. I don't know when that op-ed was actually, Nick. When, when did, was that written? Do you remember? Couple of, is that a it, couple of years ago? It's more than that. I think it was four years ago. Four years ago. And you talked about Kevin Green, and he was one of your childhood friends who had passed away. And this was sort of, I think, set you on this journey in a way. And, uh, you know, one of the things I think that struck you not only was about his story, but the reaction to his story and the lack of understanding and empathy many of your readers showed to towards someone like Kevin Green. Tell us about that and um, you know how you were trying to, to fight that or counter that reaction by not only writing this book, by doing this film as well. Yeah, the, I mean, the reaction really kind of angered me. Um, Kevin was my high school running buddy. Uh, he uh, then, you know, over time, he, he initially had some uh, good jobs and then they kind of went away uh, he uh, he he got a criminal record with drugs and alcohol uh, he had uh, twin sons but never married he became obese and I saw this very complicated guy who had really tried very very hard to make a go of it who worked incredibly hard he, he would go along the road picking up cans uh, to recycle and 
uh, when the article appeared with a photo of Kevin, all people saw was this big fat guy who didn't have a job and who had not married the mom of the kids. And uh, there were just so many really brutal put downs of, of Kevin. Uh, and like what? Do you remember some of them? Like it was stuff about how uh, if he was hard up, he should have, you know, he could have eaten less, and that would have helped solve his health problems. He uh, that he he there was a lot of comments about him not marrying his girlfriend, and I mean the re he I think he wanted to marry her, but she when he couldn't get a job, then she left him and took the twins with with her, um, and I. Uh, just a lot of kind of contempt and scorn for somebody who had not graduated from high school, who didn't have a, a solid job, and who who kind of looked, you know, he looked sort of hillbillyish, I think, to people. But I, and, what I, I love, though, that even in this film, when your friends talk about you, who had a very different track, they say, "But you're still just a kid from Yamhill, so things can things can go off the rails." far more easily than you think. And then as you say, when you're talking to those people, you have no armor because those are your friends. And It's so much harder, yeah. I mean, it's so much harder, Katie, to, to write about distress among your old friends, among, you know, people that you've grown up with. And, and I do, you know, I, I do really worry when people in Yamhill see this, will they... <laughs> You know, will they? Will it resonate with them? And uh, I worry. Will about they be offended? Will they be offended? It's having some dirty laundry shown, and you know, Clayton's family. Clayton, I mean, I think Clayton really trusted me and trusted the team. And uh, he, for example, I mean, he had made and sold meth for a while, and he really debated about whether or not to share that. And uh, I. I worry that people, either when they read the book or when that they see the doc, that they will see this guy who screwed up, who broke the law, uh, who who didn't have a good job, rather than this kid who, you know, wanted to have a good job, wanted to make a go of it, and when you're kicked out of school in the ninth grade, uh, then you end up doing what you can, and he kind of drifted into that into that world and you know he would have been the first to acknowledge that he made mistakes and in the end I think that was why he agreed to 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 be in the dock and to have this because he you know he knew that he had made mistakes but he also wanted people to understand how easy in America in the 21st century it is to fall off that tightrope you know we if you're in this room, you're you're probably walking along this you know wide, smooth, smooth path. And when you screw up and fall over, you can pick yourself up again. For a lot of people of a, in a lot of demographics in America, you're on a tightrope and one fall, and and that's it. I, are you hoping? You know, I I remember when I did a documentary about our changing notion of gender identity. Uh, you know, I I traced a lot of different people from a five-year-old transgender girl to a 70-year-old transgender woman who had gender conf uh, confirmation surgery at 70 and stayed married. And I remember Dr. Oz said, it's hard to hate up close. And I, I remember thinking that's such a powerful statement. And are you hoping that by hearing these individual stories that people will think they're, think they're but for the grace of God go I, or they're really, really not that different than we are. They're just a victim of their circumstances. Well, I think that that is one of the key uh, things that we're trying to show is that behind you know, even the homeless people that you walk, you step over on, you know, on the city blocks here, there is a story. And there are some really deep stories and people are struggling, you know, they're not happy in their situation, but they just don't know how to cope uh, for various reasons. And, and, you know, drugs are playing a huge role in this society. I mean, the reason why we have, you know, a, a declining life expectancy is partly because one segment, you know, if you look at census data, and Ann Case and, and um, Angus Deaton, two professors at Princeton, did look at the census data, and they looked, yes, of course, 
life expectancy are rising, mortality rates are dropping, we are living longer, except for one segment of the society, and that is middle-aged white men and, and women, uh, and mostly in the rural areas. Uh, they are the forgotten people, and so you know we need to you know reach out to them because each one of them has a story like this behind it, and that's what we're hoping to show that you know show a little bit of compassion, sort of try and reach out and understand that they're not an other. I mean, we tend and to otherize people. You have to contextualize people. it politically, which you do in the book, and we also do in this, in this film. So yeah. What's going? You know, what what's the message? What are these government messages of you know the the worst words in the English language, or you know, I'm the government and I'm here to help you? Like, what this notion of 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 helping people, or what those systems in, are in place are um, are really for the weak and and useless, and they're not. Can, so, can you and run through, Maro and, and Josh, can you just run through some of the other stories? Because Yam Hill is just one of the settings that yeah. you explore these issues. Um, can you just give us bullet points of some of the other other characters in this documentary? So, so the film is really uh, looking at um, a lot of the, the push factors behind this crisis of why so many millions of Americans are falling through the cracks. Um, so, you know, there's this intersection of um, both uh, people struggling with addiction and uh, people struggling with affordable housing and homelessness. Uh, we go to Baltimore and we follow uh, a number of characters that paint this sort of uh, collective story of what has happened there over the last 20 years with the war on drugs and with the opioid crisis. And you know, we had particularly moving uh, moments with this Lieutenant Olson who was running this pioneering program where he uh, would go and find addicts who were either, you know, in the throes of addiction or, you know, had been using the night before and bring them in and instead of arresting them, get them treatment. And it was this movement in Baltimore to recognize that this is a mental health issue. This is not a crime issue. Um, and that transitions into looking at a young man in uh, Yam Hill Drew, who was also the son of one of Nick's good friends, who is himself now coming out of prison, coming out of addiction, and with a one-year-old baby, looking to just get back up on his feet, in, however he can, um, and raising that baby himself as a single dad. Uh, and then we're in Virginia with a mother, um, Kathleen, who, uh, a grandmother, I'm sorry, who is living with her, uh, her daughter and her daughter's multiple children in a hotel room in Virginia because they couldn't afford uh, the $323 that was the increase in their monthly rent, and they were evicted from their home. And um, now they're paying so much to yep. live in a motel. And there's strips of motels, and then and and not just in Virginia, that where you're sort of suddenly trapped into this you know motel uh, living that is um, really hard to watch and really hard to see. Any so. other characters that you'd like to share with us for, well, I think, from Tightrope? Uh, I mean, I, I love the, uh, the uh, we go to the school in Virginia, uh, the Circle Preschool, which is doing incredible work. Uh, Kathleen Ryan doing amazing work with families whose children are experiencing extreme trauma. And we really focus on the idea, which Viva was a big uh, proponent of pushing, of, you know, we really have to look at trauma as something that starts at an early age and then it escalates and it grows. And it leads to the kind of decisions that derail the lives of people like Clayton and Kevin. And I just think, you know, I want to say in making this film, you know, you realize America is really good at punishing people. We are really good about penalizing people and throwing them in prison or, you know, doing, making sure they get their whatever their, you know, their comeuppance for whatever mistakes they make. And I think that uh, in one section in Oregon, we meet this woman, Diane Reynolds, who's running this organization, Provoking Hope. And she talks about the fact that these people are more than their addiction. They're more than the things they struggle with. And we, as Americans, don't give them that. We don't let them have that bigger identity. And she talks about you know, going up to somebody who is a, a drug addict and saying, hey, I left my wallet in my car. Here are my car keys. Can you get my wallet for me? And, and the people, she said, are always shocked. They're shocked that somebody would trust, would trust them. them. And I think that's something that we as Americans need to recognize, and Nick and Cheryl are pointing to so, so, so powerfully, that this is about trust. It's about empathy. It's about recognizing ourselves in other people who are maybe in their worst moments. And when she does that, do they, 
does that person get her wallet and bring it to her? She's never yeah. had anybody, you know, you know, take anything from her. <coughs> They've gone on errands, given her wallet back, and it's it's she a turning point always, for so many of them. Like, they can't believe it. They can't believe that somebody believes in them, which is so great. Can I ask you a question? Sure. You, I mean, you've wrestled with these issues, and one, I think one of the challenges that we had was often how to present the just unvarnished, warts and all truth uh, and things that people had done and yet preserve their dignity too and not have fewer stereotype them. And I mean, that's, you wrestled with the same issue over and over. I just wonder how, how when you're filming, how, how you convey the full truth that is sometimes pretty humiliating where, you know, whereas still doing it in a way that viewers are going to respect and honor that person. Uh, how, uh, you know, any thoughts about that? Well, I, I, I don't know. In my reporting through the years, I've just always tried to be incredibly respectful of people. And I think tomorrow's point, there's always a reason, you know, and I tend to see the good in people and to understand the the powerful external factors that have put them in a position or even the childhood trauma that they might have experienced and to kind of dig a little deeper to understand why they are the way they are or why they are where they are. And I think with that kind of honesty um, and also treating them with dignity, um, I think you're able to convey that, and it's something that I think you all do so beautifully in your work. I, I want to throw to another clip because we're mm -hmm. going to take questions pretty soon. And I want, I think one of the points of this panel is to just show this collaboration that has right. been so, so important and effective for all four of you. So this is a, a clip from the 2015 documentary, A Path Appears, and um, we're going to show that and then talk a little bit and about it. I think it. an interesting thing to say before this clip is that I think that it, it, it brings up a question to think about when you're watching this, and I think it comes up in all of the work that we're talking about, is, is as journalists, there's a difference between when you're writing someone's story and it's, it's being written in a, in a column or a piece. It's going to go in a book. Are we going to film and see that person? So the journalistic lines of of where do you draw the line, what seems okay, how do those boundaries move, is something that we've constantly wrestled with. Over. Well, I think they're different for yes. every medium, right? They're and really that's different. why it's so, I think, important that you kind of have this transmedia or, yeah. you know, approach, because I think there are situations where somebody may feel comfortable crying to you and telling you his or her story but they don't want to do it in front of a film crew, or they don't want to have it recorded on camera. But so I think and it, sometimes you, we're in the midst of investigating. We're not. Fig I mean, this is in the clip that you're going to see. It's like we don't. We're we're trying to find something. We're we're on the hunt for a larger story, and then suddenly something happens, and we're in the middle of filming. And uh, this I'm talking. This is the 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 clip in Boston with with. Um, uh, our, our missing girl. So and we, can I set it yeah, up? Or, go or ahead. I don't want to to spoil it. But you're, Nick, you're in this clip. You're sitting with the mother of a missing daughter, and you discover something. I guess in the process. Yeah. So let's take a look at that. This is a path of tears. That's pretty brutal to watch. Did you have any trepidation about using that? Uh, about putting that mom in that situation where she's discovering that, seeing her daughter in that position? I, well, I don't think we knew we were going to have that exact moment. I mean, I will say in the positive, she got her daughter back. So sometimes we, we, you know, we've all had conversations about are things that, that happen crossing the line, but in the end of the day, are they actually changing the situation for that person and and especially for other people. So, but I think the journalism line you guys should talk about because it's a it's a big one. Did you ask yeah. her if it was okay to use it? Uh, yeah, yeah, and the girl herself, so she's 15 years old. She was, uh, that night the police traced her to 
a hotel room. Uh, there were two girls. The pimp was armed. He was arrested. Uh, and the girl herself, had, she testified at the pimp's trial. Uh, and she has since become sort of active against Backpage. She wrote a, uh, she and I tried to write a collaborative column together about Backpage. That, that didn't work out, but she did write her own letters about uh, Backpage. And I think the family kind of felt that, look, this is something that affects a lot of other kids around the country, and if uh, what happened to her can be used to galvanize a greater effort to crack down on Backpage to help other 15-year-olds in that position. Then they were, you know, they were all they were they were good with that. So I think that in general, the broader question about the journalistic line. Uh, so we actually uh, uh, confronted that in uh, in Half the Sky when uh, we had been reporting, basically reporters overseas and writing about stories overseas. And so throughout the book, we actually really did try to maintain sort of a journalistic ethic. We were very um, you know, balanced in our reporting. We really you know, focused on the facts and we wanted the facts. The facts were just so, <laughs> so horrific that we, we felt that they would tell the story. So we didn't have to embellish, so to speak. Uh, but then towards the end of the book, we decided that, you know, at the end of the day, though, because some of these are so horrific, you still have to take a stand as a human being uh, to another human being. And that's when we said, okay, but we, you know, told the reader, now we are, you know, moving away outside of our, our journalistic role and into our, the role of being a human being, uh, which is that, you know, it's very hard to turn your back on many of these atrocities. And so I think that that's the fine line that we are trying to tread. I'm no longer a journalist, so it's easy for me to say, but um, I think that it is much more uh, you know, important for us to maintain the idea of balanced reporting and good reporting, because that's what gives uh, you know, the book's credibility, because we want to make sure that we are getting the facts right. We're not stretching the facts, even in this day and age. Um, and at the same time, uh, we'll call out when these atrocities need to be fixed. And also, when solutions crop up. We really are focused on solutions. We want solutions to be implemented. I know that's super important for all the work you do, that you don't want to just say, this is the problem. You really want to have a call to action after every film. And I think we'll end by talking about tightrope. But first, I want to give people in the audience an opportunity to ask you all questions, because I've been kind of picking all the questions. These lights are so bright. Uh, so do you guys, anybody out there have questions for anyone on the panel that you'd like to ask? Um, I'm not sure how, to, I, I don't think there are microphones for them, are there? They just, you all just stand up. Oh, hi. We did the book first. Yeah, that was that was the idea to, to do the book first. Yeah, this one. But but you were All saying yeah. well, the the yeah. idea of what their what the book their next book was going to be, and that we were going to hopefully you know do the film happen simultaneously. But they actually, um, of course, develop and spend quite a bit of time trying to develop what is our next book about? What are we going to tackle? How are we going to do that? And then, you know, we get to like jump on that bandwagon um, after they've really come up with what, what it is that they want to do next. And, um, and then they sort of work simultaneously, but almost, almost usually they, they're able to finish just because of the nature of how the films are made. They, they finish the book first, but um, we try as much as we can to bring them out into the world in, at the same time. So the book actually is not uh, going to be released until uh, the first quarter of 20. January. Yeah, January. January. Jan mid January. And, um, and, and the film will be you know, soon after, we hope, and that's, that's the plan. And, and also, we also have to find qu quite a bit of funding. It's very nice to have like your house and your, your computer and your typewriter and your pen. And they're, you know, they obviously have to travel and do all sorts of things to talk to people. But as we know, movies are very expensive. So on that, on that level, um, we also you know, thank our funders so deeply, in this case, uh, Virginia Public Media, uh, VPM, who have a you know, wonderful foundation, and we did work on the film in Virginia um, as well. So you always have to find believers. 
Um, so that was lucky for lucky for us in the case of tightrope, and, and public media has always been a friend. My fellow UVA grad, <laughs> Mike, uh, I know was responsible for that. <laughs> Can I just add that, um, you know, we, for Cheryl and me, our natural wheelhouse is books. So that's kind of how we, you know, how we think about uh, the storytelling. But we also know that at the end of the day, we want to have an impact. We want to shape the debate. We want to build empathy. We want to lay a foundation for better policy. And one of the challenges with books is that, by and large, people only buy and read a book if they already agree with its bottom line. And what if you want to preach beyond the choir, then you know books, books tend to preach to the choir. And so in trying to reach beyond the choir, uh, that is where film is a really, really powerful medium. You can watch a film by mistake. <laughs> uh, and in... In our we films, hope it's we've intentional, tried. actually. Yes, you know, I, I also <laughs> think come on this, Wednesday by mistake, please. <laughs> I also think this 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 film and this book, honestly, at a, a very polarized time in our country. I mean, how many times have we used the word polarized in the last two years? This is a film that both sides of the aisle, and and no matter what your pol political ideology may be, it's really a film calling on us to have compassion. And I think people who have, feel forgotten will see themselves in the character and the people who have done, frankly, the forgetting will be reminded that there is this group of people in our country that we keep at arm's length. And, you know, and, and so I agree with you, people are looking or getting affirmation instead of information from the books and the news sources, quite frankly, they're gravitating towards. And this to me is, is incredibly effective in bridging the divide. And I'm curious, do, you know, I, I can't not ask you about politics because I know your recent column actually, um, I have a quote, you said America's, uh, in, earlier this week, Nick, you said America's dysfunction goes beyond Trump and it will outlast Trump even if it, as it is aggravated by him. So, you know, do you see the current crop of candidates addressing this population and some of the people that you visited in the course of writing this and making this film so that they don't feel as aggrieved as they might have back in 2016? And how do you see sort of uh, if, and do you see a post-Trump solution to some of these problems? Um, or how do you see it all unfolding, I guess? You used to want to have Mr. Trump in the title. You were <laughs> I thought about it, yeah. <laughs> the, um, Pay attention, Mr. Trump. So, well, I think he has paid more attention than maybe some other people, and that's why he's sitting in the, in the Oval White Office. House. Yeah. I mean, I think that Trump was very effective at speaking to... Uh, people who'd been left behind, and that a lot felt scorned, neglected, nobody was interested in their problems, and then Trump spoke to them. And uh, it, you know, many of the people who were in the documentary voted for President Trump for that reason, and many of my friends in Yamhill did. Uh, and How did they feel about him now? So... In general, I'd say they have been completely unconcerned by Ukraine, by various other scandals. What matters to them is the economy. And when we have these arguments about uh, Trump, then they say, well, the economy is doing great. Uh, I think that if the economy slows down, then I think it's very vulnerable with that community. But if it remains strong, then I think they will excuse a lot of other things. I. You know, I do think that there was a bipartisan failure over decades to deal with some of these underlying issues. And as Cheryl said earlier, you know, we were number one in the world in high school uh, attendance in the 1960s. Now we rank number 61. That was a slide that took decades. Uh, the, you know, many of these other longer term pathologies are uh, longer term. But I do think that President Trump betrayed that confidence that people placed in him. And I mean, the fact that sort of in the tumult from Washington, it hasn't got much attention, but 400,000 people have lost their Medicaid insurance. 
uh, since Trump was elected. 400,000, I'm sorry, 400,000 kids, is it kids under 18. I mean, that is a staggering impact on health care of kids. And so... Um, we saw that actually have an impact on the midterm elections in 2018. Yes, health care was such a motivating factor for sort of democratic gains. And, and just in closing, do you think that the Democratic candidates are making the same mistakes that were made in 2016 in terms of really not speaking to this population and coming up with concrete ways that they will, in fact, make their lives better? So I think that the candidates have been somewhat better. I do think that there is an impulse in the Democratic Party to dismiss all Trump voters as racists and bigots. And if you do that, it's very hard to get people whom you've dismissed as racists and bigots to vote for your candidate. Um, I do think that a number of the Democratic candidates appreciate that. Uh, a number of their policies would be enormously helpful on health care, on education, on jobs. Um, but it's kind of unfortunate that those candidates who would often do most to help this demographic come across as elitist, elitist patronizing, uh, condescending, and that was certainly true of Hillary Clinton, even though I think her policies would have you know, been an awful lot better for the Greens, for example, than, than uh, President Trump's were. Um, I, there's an understanding intellectually of that challenge within the Democratic Party. Whether or not people can bridge that, I think, is still to be seen. Well, I, I just got the Time's Up sign. And uh, thank you all so much. I'm really looking forward to reading the book and watching the film. In January, the book comes out? January 14th. January 14th. And the film? Uh, it's probably soon after. We'll, we'll, we're in discussion. <laughs> <laughs> to be determined. To be anyway, determined, great to see you all. Thank you so much, Katie. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank Katie. You. Okay.